Welcome to Inside Healthcare. Health officials want you to know that heart disease remains the number one killer of women in America. It is killing one woman every 80 seconds, taking more lives than any forms of cancer combined. To me, it's more than an alarming statistic. On February 2nd of this year, my older sister Diane would have turned 73, and I'm sad to say she lost, I lost my sister to heart disease. She died suddenly a few weeks ago, right before the new year. And I know my sister, who was a healthcare provider, would want me to let every woman listening to me to be aware of the warning signs of heart disease. Regardless of your age, it could save your life. One Twin Cities woman also wants you to know about the importance of CPR. Last January, she was home and when she suddenly collapsed and suffered a sudden cardiac arrest and she stopped breathing. Fortunately, her sons and her husband were home at the time and they had taken first aid training through the scouts. So they immediately took action in performing CPR until help arrived. Jenny, her youngest son, Theo, and her husband, Todd, tell us what happened. January 17th, 2021, I had a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, I had no risk factors. I had no warning symptoms. Um, to this day, we do not have an explanation for why it happened. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, uh, my switch very abruptly turned off. Um, and uh, honestly, I can't tell this part of the story because I wasn't there. Um, the thing that happens when you have a sudden cardiac arrest is that it really is like your switch gets turned off. Um, it's just done. Um, so my son Theo was in the room with me and noticed that I was not breathing and not responding to him. So he called to his brother, his older brother, uh, and then came, went down to get my husband from the, the home office. And, uh, then you guys can tell what happened next. Yeah, tell us what happened next. I mean, it wasn't exactly when you didn't stop breathing immediately. You were just unresponsive. I don't th think you stopped breathing until after we had all gotten back up to the bathroom. Okay. And I know Max said he tried to prop you up just in case you came back to consciousness. Okay. Yeah, what I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. so what did and you thank goodness that you had some prior training yes. and from Scout, and that made a difference, a huge difference in saving your mom's life and your wife's life. Like, so. Yeah, they were really a well-oiled machine of a team. So Theo was obviously there and Theo you know, was the one that, <clears throat> rather than, you know, like panicking and screaming and, you know, just like, you know, um, I mean, obviously very frightening situation, but, you know, immediately got Max and then interestingly enough, you know, that sixth sense or something like that, um, the home office is in the basement and the footsteps that I heard coming were not the right kind of footsteps. <laughs> you I know. bet your heart was pounding. So it just like, I mean, I mean, I think I was up out of my chair before he even got to the top of the steps, just that sense of something not being right. Um, but I, again, it was just immediate, you know, just like I was not really thinking, it was acting, you know, getting up there, um, Jenny being, um, you know, again, by the time I got there, just like, you know, she had stopped breathing, she'd aspirated when she, you know, just like, you know, when she had her sudden, you know, cardi cardiac arrest. Um, so the first thing, you know, just like, you know, was I think uh, even as she was sitting there to try to like, you know, do mouth to mouth to see if that would, you know, do the trick. But, um, it, it, you know, we needed to get her, you know, needed to get her down on the floor in our bathroom. It's not a big floor, and, you know, big room. And Theo needing Max to, you know, to help manipulate Jenny, you know, got Theo, you know, on calling 911 right away, um, you know, that, that he was ready to help and do that. Um, and then 
you know, even he said it's just like he got it wrong the first time that he did 911, but didn't panic and, you know, redialed it, you know, again. And then the 911 dispatcher was very helpful, but um, I guess this goes into the scouts. You know, it's just like almost every year in scouting, especially through Cub Scouts, you know, just like there's all the requirements that you have to do every year. And every year it's just like there's the, you know, the family emergency you know, stuff and, the, and the, the medical stuff. And certainly even as an adult leader, you know, just like there, there have been times it's like, didn't we just do this last year? Why are we doing this again? And certainly it's just like this was the eye opener of this is why we do this every year. You know, it's and just like, like everyone should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just it's in one of those where and I think Max had just taken um, uh, the first aid merit badge the summer before at scout camp. And um, I mean, you know, as a scout leader and, you know, just like and I just I was amazed at, you know, just like because he jumped in on chest compressions. I mean, without a second thought and like a pro, you know, just like, I mean, and even he had started the chest compressions before the dispatcher had started, you know, like counting off. And I mean, Max was right, you know, maybe a little bit off, but he was kind of right there with the number of, you know, chest compressions, um, you know, et cetera. And I bet it seemed like forever before the, the ambulance or the paramedics arrived. It did. Yeah. But I'm sure it, it was only minutes, right? It, it, I mean, incredibly yeah. fast. I mean, I just I can't, I'm so happy for our, our local station for St. Paul Fire in general, uh, just how prepared they were. Um, Theo, just again, kind of like, you know, he was, he was ready to like, you know, when after he had done the 911, he was ready to, you know, like, you know, answer the door and help, you know, lead them to where, you know, where we were. So just like, again, um, just, we all played our part and, you know, just like what we needed, you know, to do um, until, until, you know, the, EMTs got here and then you know Max I guess once they were here it's just like that was kind of a little disconcerting scene in the living room so Max kind of seeing that Theo was you know a little visibly upset you know just like you know um, suggested that he go downstairs and kind of like you know calm himself a little bit so um, I think everybody was looking out for for each other and yeah it was uh, definitely can't and that see. was that was crucial crucial to your surviving, this immediate CPR. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, not just, I mean, yes, surviving, but uh, also- um, Fully recovering. No oxygen deficits, yeah. right? They, they started so, they responded so quickly. There was not, you know, a lot of like, what do we do? I don't know, what do we, uh, right? They just knew these are the steps that we take when this thing happens. And so they were able to respond. Um, and I have had an absolutely remarkable recovery. Um, I uh, am as healthy, if not healthier, <laughs> you know, definitely as healthy as I was before. Um, you know, we're an active family. We use our bodies all the time. We're outdoors a lot and, uh, uh, there was really just a very brief period of time there where, um, where I was actively recovering and unable to, I was very quickly able to be back participating fully in our active family life. So, um, so yes, I mean, the big, the big, I, I feel like the big, biggest part of the story is to spread the word for people to be confident and familiar just with the very basics of CPR. Um, whatever else is happening in someone's body, if they've fallen and hit their heads, if they've been in a minor car accident, if they, you know, if there's some other visible trauma, if their heart is not beating and they are not bleeding, they cannot recover from that. Um, and they can't recover from whatever other injury or illness is happening. So if you can identify that someone's not breathing and their heart is not beating, then just do CPR. Um, and I've said it to lots of people, you know, there's excellent resources from the American Red Cross, from Citizens CPR, um, uh, and uh, the American Heart Association. There's tons of, uh, you can watch a three minute online video 
that will give you everything you need to know to act quickly and confidently in an emergency situation. It doesn't have to be perfect. You, your rhythm doesn't have to be perfect. How hard your push doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it, some CPR, terrible CPR is better than no CPR. <laughs> that a great it will always help and you will not hurt the person if they don't need it. Or if there are, like I said, if there's other injuries or illnesses, they can't recover from those things if their heart is not beating. <laughs> so just take action, feel confident, um, make sure someone else is calling 911. If there's an AED available, absolutely send someone to go and get that because the sooner you can get that started, the better. But the very, very first thing is just starting compressions. Congratulations to Jenny's husband, Todd, and their sons, Max and Theo, who were recognized with Scouting's Medal of Merit at the Northern Star Scouting's Million Dollar Day for Scouting. Jenny and her family, thank you for sharing your incredible life-saving story with us. We'll be right back with more right after this short break. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out no answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey, sorry I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. This February 15th is designated as International Childhood Cancer Day. And to bring awareness about childhood cancer, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Logan G. Spector with the University of Minnesota. And you are working on some exciting international childhood cancer research. So thank you. It really is an honor to have you on the, uh, with us on the show. So thank you. My pleasure. And before we get into some of the research, just tell us a little bit about what do you do at the university. I know that you hold a number of um, distinguished titles and things like that. Yeah, well, I'm a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, which, uh, of course, is in the medical school, mainly concerned with treating children with disease. Um, but I have a PhD in epidemiology, and I run a small division filled with epidemiologists. And our main purpose is to understand why kids get cancer in the first place. The hope is that someday we'll be able to either catch it early or even better, prevent it entirely. And you have a particular focus as well in that area. I do, I focus on leukemias, um, on bone sarcomas, and on a rare liver cancer called hepatoblastoma. And you're associated then with the, is it called the um, Childhood Cancer Leukemia International Consortium? Yeah, so we call it uh, CLIC, and we have oh, a website. I, that uh, would have been shorter for me to say. No problem. <laughs> uh, and, and our website is click.ngo. We are a consortium uh, where we pool all the uh, data on causes of childhood cancer in order to come up with better and more precise answers. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Thank you. What a, a challenge to be able to do that. And can you tell us a little bit now about being, you're the lead of the international research in the, what's it called, the Red Cord? Record. Record, okay. The prenatal study funded by the NIH on the origins of leukemia in cord blood. Yeah, well, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying so, but this one's very interesting. Um, I think it sounds really interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have known for decades, in fact, that you can find signs of a leukemia at birth. Um, and so what we're doing, what we call backtracking, you take a patient's leukemia sample, you find out what's gone wrong with their DNA in the leukemia cell, and then you look for signs of that um, incorrect DNA in the cord blood. And there are a number of reasons to do this, but one of them is if we can find the pre-leukemia cells at birth, we can then design drugs to um, cause them to die off the cells, not That's the child. That's incredible. Yep. Um, and hopefully find a way to prevent childhood leukemia. So, so specifically, what are you involved with that area and how you're, what are, what are some of the things that you're doing? 
Well, um, I, I'm the epidemiologist involved. I don't so much have uh, um, a lab uh, that does this work, so I'm busy recruiting and surveying uh, the kids or the parents who have stored cord blood, and then my team gets the cord blood and um, all the clinical data, and then we hand off the samples to our colleagues at the University of Southern California and Oxford University in the UK. Hence the international part of the, the research and stuff like that. That's right. And how long has, have you been working on that? Well, that study started about six months ago, oh, and uh, we're then. already getting the, the cord blood rolling in. Um, we're going to start analyzing the samples uh, in the next month or so, and then um, we'll have results coming out in, probably for the next four years. So this is just um, blood that's, uh, cord blood that's donated by families then? Yeah, so there are two ways people donate cord blood in the U.S. Uh, one is um, they donate it to a bank, a nonprofit, yes. um, and the other is that they store it at their own expense. Um, and um, either way, when a child develops leukemia, because we know that there can be pre-leukemic cells at birth, one would never think of uh, using that cord blood clinically. So the next best use is research. And what do you anticipate or what, what, what is your hope will come out of this then? Well, I hope we'll be able to isolate pre-leukemic cells. We'll be able to tell uh, what proteins are on the surface uh, of the cells and we'll use that to be able to zap them, if you will. That is incredible. That can actually help save some young lives. I hope. I, I hope that the lives we save will never know that they would have been in danger, in fact. Wow. That is awesome. And why is it, um, why, uh, why are you interested in this area? Why, um, in particular, um, in the childhood cancer research? Well, uh, I did start out in adult cancer, and for many of them, we, we know what causes it, and we're just trying to get people to stop, like smoking, for instance. Um, whereas in kids, we don't know what causes it for the most part, and um, most of the things that we think might cause it, uh, you know, um, we have a harder time getting people to stop. In some cases, it's not even things that, that we'd ask people to stop, like, um, there's some curiosity about whether dietary folate could be promoting cancers, but it also has good aspects. So it, it might be a balance between a, a seeding a cancer and um, a feeding the rest of the body. In any case, we're, we're trying to um, figure out, you know, why kids get cancer, uh, and, you know, ultimately I think that it's a... Um, useful thing to do because they're kids and not a single one of them asked for it. Absolutely, and same for the parents as well. True. Yeah, I think that they would feel somehow that they're to blame, but no one is to blame. Correct. Yeah, so some of the things that you do know, I mean, what advice would you tell to a viewer watching this about some of the research you're doing and, and how this could help someone else? Well, um, the general public doesn't need to be concerned or um, change their behavior to prevent cancer in a child, mainly because cancer in a child is very, very rare. That's not to say that they shouldn't be as healthy as possible, but uh, there's nothing specific for the general public to do. For a small slice of the public that has a cancer predisposition, so that means they have a version of a gene that gives them a um, hundred or a thousand or a ten thousand fold risk of a very rare cancer. Those people should be seen by a specialist who knows how to um, image them or otherwise track when the, uh, a tumor might appear and catch it early. Um, and the research shows that catching them early in this scenario does improve uh, a child's outcome. And you had mentioned about smoking can be linked to leukemia? In, yeah. can, in general, cancer? Um, it, it, it's mostly linked to childhood leukemia, and surprisingly, we don't have good evidence that the mother's own smoking causes it. It's mostly linked to the father's smoking before conception. That said, there are many, many reasons for people not to smoke. So, um, you know, knowing that it might cause a child's leukemia is a good reason, but far from the only reason to stop smoking. 
Anything else that you want our viewers to know about the cancer research that you're, the childhood cancer research that you're doing? Absolutely. Um, childhood cancer in general is fairly treatable, so it's one of the victories on the war on cancer. Um, it, the treatment uh, success is somewhere around 85 or 90 percent for cancer in general, but there are some types that are just very biologically resistant. There's a tumor called DIPG that's almost u universally fatal. And so there still needs to be a lot of research uh, onto curing those resistant cancers. Also, uh, cure comes with a cost. While we have pushed the survival up, uh, there are problems that appear decades later uh, because of the cancer treatment. And so there's a very large need to um, study and help childhood cancer survivors, which there are almost half a million in the U.S. Yeah, it seemed like I remember it had to be like late 60s, early 70s, talking about when someone got leukemia, you know, um, it's, it was almost fatal at that time. It was. And that's really changed because of dedicated research that you're doing type of thing. Definitely. I mean, I, I could have been a patient back then, but, uh, um, you know, Sidney Farber, uh, if you ever heard of him, I the, the yeah. Dana-Farber Institute is named after him. Uh, he's the person who um, really pushed chemotherapy for um, ALL, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, okay. into the mainstream. If you want to read all about that history, I'd recommend the book, The Emperor of All Maladies. Very fascinating. I will make sure I'll be checking that out. Um, you know, at the beginning of this, I mentioned that um, February 15th is the International Childhood Cancer Awareness Day. Why, why is it important to, re to recognize this and, and celebrate this every year then? Well, uh, I mean, most people think cancer and they think um, much older people. Um, a, a cancer that occurs in a child is rare, but it's incredibly disruptive both to the child and to the family. Um, you can you lose, a child can lose years of education. Uh, of course, I already talked about the, the late effects of therapy, um, but the families go through emotional turmoil and, and what's called financial toxicity. Uh, it's a tragedy that, that strikes the child and everyone that knows and cares for them. Uh, and that's the basic reason that we want to get the word out. Well, it really has been an honor to have you on the program, so thank you. Final comments on if people want some more information about childhood cancer? Sure. Probably the single best site to go to is the National Cancer Institute. If you Google um, NCI and childhood cancer, it'll come right up. Well, Dr. Spector, a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And we'll be back with more right after this. Vision loss is not something that you feel until it happens. Most people lose their vision from diseases like macular degeneration and glaucoma, not at birth. Three million Americans have glaucoma, and half don't even know it. 11 million people in the United States have macular degeneration. So many eye disorders can be treated if caught early. Make a plan today to get your eyes checked. Visit brightfocus.org to learn more. While COVID cases continue, doctors are now seeing flu activity on the rise during these first few weeks of 2022. Here is Dr. Will Nicholson with M Health Fairview on the flu and COVID. What was most interesting about last year is flu is almost non-existent because we had such tight uh, control of, of transmissibility, such lockdown society. Um, you know, the, the flu sneaks in the same way that, that COVID does. You know, all these infections are transmissible in similar ways. I wouldn't advise people to try to figure out, uh, you know, what do I have? Um, I, would, I would advise them to, you know, rule out COVID, uh, but not forget that, yeah, you could also have influenza A or B, and there are quite a few cases there. And if, if you're getting really sick, you know, get checked out. Now, it's important for people to remember that, yes, there's a lot of frustration about access to testing. Um, and, and home tests, you know, they're convenient, uh, but they're not as accurate, they're hard to find, and they're expensive. The, the PCR tests, the more specific testing, uh, is available, but there's a wait sometimes. You know, sometimes it's, it's at a place where you have to wait in line, or you have to send it in the mail and, and wait a little while to get it back. Um, but by and large, you don't need to access a, a clinic you know, or, or, or pay for a consultation or go to the ER 
if you're just having some symptoms, uh, you know, you should stay home and get tested efficiently. And, and the best test is the one that you do. You know? So if, if you have access to one and not the other, you know, I, I would say use it and, 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 you know, act accordingly to, to the results. Again, the guidelines continue to evolve, but there, there are great resources out there to kind of guide you through what is your specific scenario? How far are you from, from your first symptom and, and what you should do next? Uh, but if you get sick and you're not getting better or you get worse, you know, that's when it, it's a good idea to, to seek medical consultation, especially if you're very short of breath. Again, great advice. Um, final advice for our viewers. The main message again that you want to leave with our viewers. You know, I, I think it's really that uh, when you when you get down to a, we're all in this together, and none of us wants to be the person that spreads COVID uh, to somebody else. And we've got the tools. Uh, if we work together, we can keep each other and ourselves healthy, and we can get uh, get all my healthcare uh, colleagues through this. Uh, and, and not have to not have to take some of the measures that we've seen other communities, other cities, and other countries have to take. Uh, you know, that's that's what I'm shooting for. Uh, that's what I believe we can do. And I'm just again thankful for the opportunity to address our community here and uh, encourage them not to not to give up. Let's do this together. Let's get through it. There are a ton of healthcare workers out there depending on you, and there's a bunch of people that need routine health care and surgery and other regular stuff. Um, that won't get it if we if we don't control this this pandemic right now. So, for their sake and for the sake of the healthcare workers, help us out and let's let's not spread this anymore. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us here on Inside Healthcare. Join us next time. We'll see you then, everyone. Stay safe.